Our last talk this morning will be paper number 101, which is entitled The Homogeneous Carbon Hydrogen Bond Activation by Electrophilic Palladium II Species. The authors are A. Sen, E. Gretz, and T. Oliver. And the paper will be presented by Houston Sen. Thank you. The good news is I only have transparencies, so we don't have to worry about this slide. Uh, let me start by thanking Wayne for giving me the opportunity to talk at this fine symposium and thanking you for sticking around for what's probably the last talk in the whole ACS conference. Uh, it's somewhat awe-inspiring to talk uh, to a group of heterogeneous catalyst specialists because you can do things on metal symbol oxide surfaces that we can't even begin to do on, in homogeneous solutions. You've been talking about conversion of methane to ethane and ethylene, and that's something we can only dream about. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's important to try to find homogeneous counterparts of heterogeneous reactions, not just because there are certain inherent advantages to homogeneous catalysis, like selectivity and low uh, reaction, uh, mild reaction conditions, but also so that we can undertake mechanistic studies so we can understand how these reactions proceed. It's a lot more difficult to do some, such studies on surfaces because the analytical techniques for surface characterization are primitive compared to what one can do in, in, in solution. So we have been interested in trying to do selective oxidation of hydrocarbons. As, as someone pointed out in this talk, methane and other saturated alkanes are dirt cheap whereas something like methanol or other oxygenated uh, organics are a lot more expensive. In fact, the most important organic chemicals used industrially are all oxidized, that is, they're related to hydro saturated hydrocarbons by some oxidation step. And the question is, how can one achieve selective oxidation of saturated hydrocarbons? <coughs> now, there are two problems. Uh, you can't just take a saturated hydrocarbon and bubble oxygen through it, for example. One problem, even though oxygen is, is, is really quite a powerful, powerful oxidant, has a potential of 1.3 volts, so it's up there. So, so from a thermodynamic standpoint, oxygen is a really powerful oxidant, but nevertheless it doesn't work very well, which is in some sense good. We live in an oxygen atmosphere and we don't burn up. Uh, and the reason, uh, there are two, two reasons for that. First of all, oxygen is a diradical, and so when you start reacting oxygen with hydrocarbons, you end up getting into radical chain processes. And this is a typical example. I don't wish to go through this, but it just shows you uh, some of the problems associated with just straight oxygenation of hydrocarbons. The other problem is that oxygen is a diradical, it's a, it's a paramagnetic species, a triplet, Whereas organic compounds are singlets, and for a triplet to react with a singlet, there has to be a spin flip, which means there's an activation <coughs> energy, relatively high activation energy barrier associated with the reaction of oxygen with saturated hydrocarbons. And, and this is where a metal can come in and mediate this oxidation process. Uh, this has been done successfully with hydrogen, for example, catalytic hydrogenation is well known, catalytic hydroformulation where you activate carbon monoxide and hydrogen with transition metals are well known. So maybe we can use transition metals to mediate oxidations also. Now, what are some of the modes, <coughs> modes of interaction of metals with alkanes? Well, one can think of three different processes. One is a one electron redox process, two electron redox process, and finally an electrophilic displacement process. Now, a typical example of a one electron redox process is, is this, where you take a one electron oxidant, probably one of the best examples is cobalt-3, and you react with the hydrocarbon, the cobalt gets reduced, pumps an electron into the alkane, and that splits up into a radical. Well, we've oxidized the alkane to a radical, 
But the problem again is we have now made a free radical which goes around making 200 different products. So that's not a very useful way of doing it. Uh, just to give you an example, this is taken from a paper by Schultz and co-worker uh, regarding oxidation of hexane with cobalt-3. Uh, and again, I don't want to take you through this whole thing, but you can see you generate a hexane radical, and the further oxidation takes you to cyclohexanol, bicyclohexyl, cyclohexanone, open chain products, and so on and so forth. So you get a host of different products, again, because you generate a free radical. Now, this is not to say that if you generate free radicals, everything is lost. If you can confine your free radical sterically in a, in a small environment where you can do selective oxidation, you can do very well with free radicals. And perfect, the, the best example is the enzyme cytochrome P450, <coughs> where uh, this is the mechanism proposed by Groves. One <coughs> starts off with an iron species, forms an iron oxo species, and this now abstracts a hydrogen from a given alkane, and you make an alkyl radical, which then abstracts a hydroxide to make the alcohol. So you can do selective, very selective oxidation of alkanes to alcohols. And this procedure, but the only reason it works is your radical is confined within this enzyme pocket. Okay, and so it doesn't go loose, react with various other things. So while you can't do selective oxidation with free radicals, it is only possible under very special, special circumstances. The other problem, of course, is that free radicals are high energy species. So from a thermodynamic standpoint, this is a table from a book by Shilov. Uh, they are extremely unfavorable. These should, should actually have negative signs. This is how it's in, the, it's in the book. So while it's perfectly reasonable to generate, for example, methyl radicals at 800 degrees in the gas phase, that's, that's fine. But it's unlikely that you will be able to generate methyl radicals at room temperature in solution, or close to room temperature in solution. So, so basically, it's hard to do selective oxidation with one electron. What about two electron processes? And the best example of that is oxidative addition, where you take a metal and you add on an RH bond and do an oxidative addition. And this has been shown by elegant work by Graham and Bergman and Jones and others. I'll just give you an, one example where you start off with a rhodium dihydride species, you photolyze it to get rid of the dihydrogen, you make a highly reactive metal species now, and that will oxidatively add carbon-hydrogen bonds of various things, methane or, or other alkanes, cyclopentane, benzene, and so on and so forth. Now, there are two problems with, with this approach also. Uh, one is, that almost invariably, with a few exceptions, to achieve an oxidative addition of a saturated CH bond, one has to generate a highly active metal species. And the reason for this is, by and large, this reaction is thermodynamically uphill because of the weakness of the metal carbon bond. <coughs> and so to make it downhill, one has to generate a highly reactive species. Well, if you generate a highly reactive species and you make, eventually you make a metal alkyl, and now you will oxidize that alkyl group. Because our eventual aim is to make an oxidized organic product. Well, you can't have the oxidant in the same part because it's going to react to the reactive metal species in the first place. So it's hard to construct a one-part procedure for doing catalytic oxidation based on such an oxidative addition reaction. That's point number one. Point number two is, this is called oxidative addition because the metal is getting oxidized and the alkane is formally at least getting reduced. Well, if you want to do oxidation of alkanes, I think it's a bad start if you start out by reducing it in the first place. And so, so those are the two problems. But having said that, 
it's not impossible to construct catalytic cycles based on oxidative addition. And elegant work by Jones, for example, this is taken from his paper, where he takes benzene and in a catalytic cycle inserts isocyanide to make imines. And, and, and that's possible. But again, note, you need light to start this reaction off. So it's basically uh, uphill to start with. The third ap approach that we have been working on is electrophilic displacement. Where one takes a metal, which is a Lewis acid, and you do a heterolytic cleavage of the RH bond to generate a proton and a metal alkyl species. Note, there is no change in the oxidation state of the metal. This can be assisted by a base, for example, so that the base will react with the proton uh, and remove it, and thus assisting this reaction. This is, has, is precedented, for example, many years ago, Jack Halpern showed that in a similar heterolytic cleavage of hydrogen by silver, amines speeded up this reaction because of this base assistance where the amine went after the proton, the silver went after what's formerly the hydride. And to give you some species like that, more recently, Wolzanski has shown using a metal emide that you can oxidatively add a carbon, I'm sorry, you can add a CH bond so that the carbon ends up on the metal, the hydrogen ends up on the emide ligand and makes it an amide ligand. So one can do a base assistance procedure to achieve this. It's not necessary, but that, that's something to keep in mind. <coughs> so what is, what is our grand scheme of oxidation using this procedure? Well, this is sort of a summary of that. Uh, we're going to take a metal, an electrophilic metal species, we're going to react it with an RH bond to make a metal alkyl plus a proton. And then we'll come in with an oxidant and oxidize the alkyl group present. And we want to use two electron oxidants because we do not wish to get into radical chemistry. Now this is, this is not totally unprecedented because Shilov and co-workers in, in Russia have shown that in using a combination of platinum-2 and platinum-4 reagents, they want to do this. He takes, for example, an RH uh, and in the platinum dichloride, <coughs> he believes he forms this species by heterolytic cleavage, and then he comes in with a platinum-4 species and oxidizes the R group to R chloride. So you go from an alkene to an alkene chloride by, by this, this procedure. <coughs> and that seems to, you know, seems to work fine, uh, except that you don't want to use platinum four compounds with oxygen, and that's not the most economical way of doing this. Uh, one other point I just want to point out is that in contrast to one electron oxidation, so you generate radicals which are high energy species, uh, two electron oxidations are for perfectly decent processes. They're thermodynamically favorable. There's no problem with respect to that. <coughs> yeah. Now, so getting back to this, uh, I want to concentrate on our work in this area. We've been only doing this for a few months, so <coughs> it's mostly in, in strategic planning stage rather than lots of results. But nevertheless, I'll tell you about what we have achieved. Now, that oxygen. What sort of oxygen can we use? Well, being an organometallic chemist, chemist who deals with transition metals, Obviously, we turned to a transition metal for an oxidant. And we said, let's, let's make one metal do both of these steps. That is, we'll have the metal electrophilic enough to carry out the first step. And at the same time, the metal should be an oxidant, so it'll do the next step. Okay, so one metal will do both the electrophilic displacement and the oxidation. And so the scheme <coughs> would look something like this where the metal does an electrophilic displacement, you make a metal alkyl, and then maybe a nucleophile will attack this alkyl group to give you the oxidized organic product. You reduce the metal down by two electrons, and perhaps with, with an 
oxygen, some other oxygen, preferably oxygen, we will get this back to the initial oxidation state. So the overall reaction is a two electron oxidation of the alkane to an oxidized product, the metal gets reduced and maybe we can recycle it. <coughs> so the question then is what sort of metal can one use? And this is this is an interesting, what I think is an interesting table of electron affinity values for different types of metals. And <coughs> this is the electron affinity, this is for motion energy. And what you notice, and this surprises at first, is that metals such as palladium and platinum have electron affinities which are comparable to main group Lewis acids such as zinc or cadmium or mercury. So they are up there in terms of electrophilicity. <clears throat> They're twice as electrophilic as silver, which is considered a reasonable electrophile or organic chemist. And they're up there with the, with the traditional main group electrophile. On the other hand, they have a low promotion energy. So that's where they differ from main group electrophiles. They have a low promotion energy, which means that they can back bond to an incoming alkane, one, and, and so form a stronger initial bonding to the alkane through back bonding. <coughs> so they will bind, you have, they might bind alkanes more easily, but they're electrophilic enough that they can then activate them, the species. Not surprisingly, low valent transitionals a very low electron affinity, also they have very low promotion energy. So it seems that uh, palladium and platinum are, are sort of ideal, and as I just pointed out, Shilov has done some nice work with platinum chemistry, which chose, chose palladium <coughs> because of, the, of our previous work in, in, in palladium chemistry. So palladium is clearly a good electrophile, and some of our previous work testifies to that, for example, uh, palladium, one can do skeletal rearrangements in homogeneous solutions using palladium compounds. Uh, what happens is you electrophilically break the pi bond to make a copper cation there. And an example of a skeletal rearrangement is you take T-butylethylene in, in the presence of this tetraacetonitrile palladium dicaton and you do a skeletal rearrangement. What happens is the palladium, palladium attacks a double bond you do a heterogeneity cleavage in the pi bond, you create a carbocationic center there. That's a secondary carbocation, so you have a methyl migration to a tertiary cation. So the cation is here, and then that loses protons, and eventually you end up getting, getting the product. So one can do activation of olefins, one can do activations of CC bonds. Uh, for example, if you take a strain CC bond, the same species will heterolytically cleave the carbon-carbon bond to make a carbon cation. And here is one example, catalytic example, where <coughs> you take cyclopropane rings and you cleave one of these bonds <coughs> and, you have, and to make these products. Uh, you can cleave here or here because these are the only two ways you can cleave it to make a tertiary stable cap carbon cation. And this is preferred because sterically this is more accessible than that because you left the group there. And eventually you get these, these products. <coughs> and one final example of a CH bond cleavage. This is also shown by us as well as Trost and others where one can take an olefin and add a palladium species and you cleave an allylic CH bond, electrophilically. So clearly, both from that table of electron affinities and from these reactions, palladium is a very powerful electrophile. The next point to establish is the fact that palladium is also a good two electron oxidant. <coughs> because, as I pointed out, not only we need an electrophile to do this step, we need an oxidant to do that step. And of course, palladium has a lot of precedence as a two electron oxidant oxidation. The WACA process is probably the best example of it, where you oxidize an olefin to an aldehyde, 
And so this is a two electron oxidation. The palladium goes from plus two to zero. And then you can use a reoxidant to oxidize the palladium back up to plus two. In this case, it's usually copper plus oxygen. So it's a good two electron oxidant. Let me give you just one other example of this. And this is the Ube process for making ethylene glycol from methanol and CO. And the most important step here is CO plus methanol in the presence of palladium to get going to the oxalate, which is reduced to the ethylene glycol. And uh, some of the mechanistic work that we and others have done indicates that palladium 2 plus <coughs> coordinates carbon monoxide. And then it's attacked by the nucleophile amine to make oxamides or alcohols to make oxalates. So you attack it by a nucleophile. And then you have two electron oxidation, essentially coupling here to make this plus palladium zero. And this can be reoxidized. So this palladium plus two ion is good oxidant, two electron oxidant, and a good electrophile. So that should work. What sort of a solvent and species do you want? Well, we want a solvent that doesn't have CH bonds because we don't want to attack the solvent. And so we chose trifluoroethylene acetic acid and palladium trifluoroacetate. <coughs> and here are some of the results. Uh, actually, I cheated here. We did not use palladium trifluoroacetate. We used palladium acetate. We used palladium acetate and trifluoroacetic acid. Um, the only reason is we got palladium acetate in stock. We didn't have palladium trifluoroacetate. In our hands. It doesn't make any difference because in trifluoroacetic acid, palladium acetate gets converted to palladium trifluoroacetate. Anyway, at 80 degrees, norbornate gets, sorry, uh, adamantane gets oxidized in high yields to the trifluoroacetate. And I guess this is the reaction that got me into this symposium. Methane uh, gets oxidized to methyl trifluoroacetate in about 60% yield. <coughs> this is a, a somewhat finicky reaction. If you need a very pure palladium species to do this reaction. But it does, it does go in reasonable, reasonable yields. Now, of course, uh, methyl trifluoroacetate can be hydrolyzed to methanol. So the overall reaction is basically taking an alkane plus palladium 2 plus plus water going to an alcohol. So this is a direct conversion of an alkane to an alcohol. Uh, normally, if you wanted to make methanol from methane, you probably would convert methane to CO and hydrogen, and then oxida, and then convert that to methanol. And this would be one a direct way of doing it. <coughs> now, there's a few things to talk about in this year. First of all, as I said, we use palladium acetate, not trifluoroacetate. And, and you might say, well, maybe the acetate ligand lost CO2 in some weird fashion, and that the methyl trifluoroacetate that we got was from the acetate. And we ruled that out by taking palladium acetate that was completely deuterate. And we used normal methane. And the product that we got had the normal methane group. There was no deuterium in the product, clearly indicating that this methyl group comes from the methane. Now, what about other hydrocarbons? Well, the other hydrocarbons also work, but they don't work as efficiently as methane, which is sort of surprising. Um, in, in radical chemistry, for example, cyclohexane is get, um, oxidized much faster than, than methane, for example. It's the other way around here, and we believe it's sterics. Uh, but one can use other hydrocarbons. The only problem is, for example, heptane, is you make, once you get to this point, you now have a beta hydrogen present there. You did not have a beta hydrogen present, obviously, in methane. And so before a trifluoroacetate group can attack it and make a trifluoroacetate, it loses a beta hydrogen and you generate an alkene. It's a slow reaction, you get lower yields than in methane, but nevertheless, you generate an alkene. So from from heptane, you go to heptene. I drew it as one heptene, but it's, I don't know for sure whether it's one heptene. Almost certainly it's isomerized. 
Uh, now that's not necessarily a bad news if, 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 if you want to oxidize an alkane because remember palladium, will palladium plus two will oxidize all of them. Remember the WACA process, it will oxidize all of them. So you can conceive of a procedure where one palladium dication will, will convert the alkene to the alkene and a second palladium to dication will convert the alkene to the oxidized product. So you need two palladium ions instead of one, but this, this should in principle work fine. Now, as far as the mechanism of this reaction is concerned, let me just take the next few minutes and discuss this. <coughs> we turn to Arenes to understand the mechanism of this reaction, and <coughs> we found that one can also do triphoracid oxidation of Arenes. For example, if you take paradigm methoxy, benzene, uh, one gets, in a few minutes, actually we don't even need 80 degrees at room temperature, in fact, as soon as you mix this with palladium trifluoracid, it starts going dark because the palladium precipitates, and you make this species in 100% yield. If you use xylene, and here one has a choice of attacking the ring carbon hydrogen bond or the benzylic carbon hydrogen bond, and if there was any radical present, one should have seen attack on the benzylic CH bond because the benzyl radical is very stable. But instead, we see uh, something like it's 20 to 1. It's actually higher than that. We get about 98% attack. 98% attack. It should be 50 to 1. 98% attack on the ring and very little attack on the benzylic position. This is different from the work reported by the Russians uh, where they carried out HD exchange with platinum species where they found that for disubstituted benzene, the exchange only occurs on the methyl groups. But in this case, at least, it, it attacks almost exclusively the ring. One can also study reactivity ratio by competition experiments where we have two different areas present and one C is the following ratio, 1 to 0.1 to 0.02 to 0. The benzene, ben, parent benzene itself always does react. <coughs> now that tells you two things. First of all, that this scheme that we propose is indeed a reasonable one, because if you're going to do an electrophilic attack, the most electron-rich arrange should react preferentially, and that's what you see. As you make the arene more and more electron rich by putting in an alkyl group and finally alkoxy groups, the rate goes up. Second, the CH bonds in an arene are more electron rich than the benzylic CH bonds and we see preferential attack on the ring. So both of these argue for, for this sort of a displacement, an electrophilic displacement step. And, and finally, with something like toluene or monosubstituted benzene, one should see preferential attack on the ortho and para positions for an electrophilic type reaction. And that's exactly what one sees. And this we did in anisole. You see almost zero meta product. You get 3 to 1 ratio of para to ortho. And again, that argues for an electrophilic displacement procedure. Finally, we will look at the kinetic isotope effect for toluene, and we see a rather large isotope effect, KH, KD of 5, which means that in the slow rate determining step, we are having a direct attack on the CH bond by the palladium 2 species. This is not the slow step formation of an arene complex, for example, because that should give you a KH, KD of almost 1. Neither is the formation of a wayland intermediate the slow step, because here again, as has been seen with other electrophiles, you get a KH, KD of 1.1, 1.2. So the large value that you see here clearly indicates that it's a direct attack on the CH, CH bond. <coughs> So we have demonstrated that this, this sort of scheme does work. Uh, next question is, can one make a catalytic by adding an oxidant? And 
Of course, the ultimate oxygen we want is oxygen. But with our equipment, we're in no position to mix methane and oxygen in high pressures. <coughs> For one thing, that, that's a no-no in, in our building. And so we have used other oxygens as a starter. Uh, and in this case, we've used uh, first sulfate and the dimethoxy benzene, and it works fine. You can get a catalytic turnover and convert this to that, the product, the ring, the ring at that. <coughs> so it is, in principle, possible to carry this out in an oxidative sense. We're now turning to other saturated hydrocarbons. While it's, it's useful to oxidize our rings, it's, I think, a lot more challenging to oxidize alkane, so that's, that's what we're, we're going next. Now, before I finish, let me take one minute and talk about uh, uh, this mechanism again. Um, the way we've written it is we have leave the bond so that the electron pair remains with R. <coughs> so formally, this is R minus, this is proton. Now, of course, we can do it the other way. That is, make an H minus and an R plus. Now, it so happens that almost always it's this way because proton is a lot more stable than a carbocation. But if you want to try weird enough compounds, you can do it the other way. So we can do it this way where the hydrogen ends up on the metal and we found an R plus, and we did it by using. <clears throat> cyclohepatriene, and this works because the tropelium cation is very stable. So in this case, with this, at the time of mixing, it's a really fast reaction. We generate the tropelium cation plus presumably the polonium hydride. We don't see it, but we certainly see quantitative formation of the tropelium cation. Well, I guess I've used up my time, so I'll stop here and acknowledge my students who did the work. And it's Effie Gretz, graduate student who was cyclohepatriene, and this works because the tropelium cation is very stable. So in this case, with this, at the time of mixing, it's a really fast reaction. We generate the tropelium cation plus presumably the polonium hydride. We don't see it, but we certainly see quantitative formation of the tropelium cation. Well, I guess I've used up my time, so I'll stop here and acknowledge my students who did the work. And it's Effie Gretz, graduate student who was who got so fascinated with the chemistry he was doing that after he graduated, he left chemistry and went into an MD program. <coughs> I guess he figured there's more money there. And Tom Oliver, a talented undergraduate who is now at Cornell, and the work was supported by U.S. Department of Energy. Finally, I thank you for your patience. Any questions?